Good morning, everyone, and welcome to episode two of our Prove, Prevent, Protect LCV Solutions webinar series. In episode one, we covered Prove and Protect, looking at cameras and how they can help protect your drivers against accidents and prove what happened when they do happen. Today, we will be looking at the prevent element. We'll be looking at compliance and how you can run a safer, um, more cost effective fleet by preventing accidents before they happen. We've got some really esteemed guests to present to you today. We've got Mark Cartwright, who is Head of Incident Prevention for Commercial Vehicles at Highways England. Uh, and we've also got Peter Golding from Fleet Check, who are a Web Fleet Solutions integration partner, uh, who specialise in helping small commercial van fleets run their fleets more efficiently and more safely. So good morning, gents. Mark, uh, you are up first. If, as we go along, everybody in the audience who's listening if you would like to submit any questions as we go uh, we will be answering them at the end uh, and after each individual speech mark good morning morning matthew um so if you'd like to take it away and um discuss with everybody um your presentation yeah absolutely matthew All right tech gods willing let's uh, let's click the button and see what happens That's a good start. Have I got control of the slide deck? There's nothing seems to be happening at the minute. Uh, can you? Ah, ah, there we go. Fantastic. OK, um, good morning. Um, if I'm just uh, start off, I, I thought a, a brief intro uh, as to Highways England and, and the role of the commercial vehicle incident and prevention team might be as good a place to start as as any this morning. Um, Highways England are responsible for 4,300 miles of motorway and what we call all-purpose trunk roads. So these are the big fast ones between the major conurbations in England. Uh, we're also pretty influential in Wales and, and Scotland, but uh, it's the English roads that are our primary concern. The strategic route network, uh, which we're responsible for, actually accounts for less than 4% of the roads in England, but I think you can get a measure of its importance to UK PLC in so much as we carry around about a third of all the traffic uh, that moves around in England, and uh, that includes, it's more than 60%, it's around about 65% of the freight that's moved around. Um, our role can be summarised into three words, uh, basically, is to operate the network, is to maintain the network, and it's to improve the network, and we spend uh, an awful lot of taxpayers' money uh, trying to achieve those ambitions. Now, can you click the slides on for me, guys? It doesn't seem to be working from this end. Oh, there we go. Um, the team that I manage is primarily a project delivery team. We uh, investigate various interventions to try and stop commercial vehicles crashing into one another, that's vans and trucks. Uh, and also to stop them uh, in being involved in incidents with other vehicles on our network. Uh, some of that is around the behaviours of the commercial vehicle drivers and the operators, an increasing amount of our activities around trying to influence and educate other road users as to the, uh, the requirements of trucks and vans on our network. We've uh, done some stuff fairly recently, which you may have seen around blind spots of commercial vehicles and, and um, ordinary civilian motorists uh, lack of understanding of the actual fields of vision of truck drivers, which is quite interesting. Um, we judged on two KPIs and they're, they're pretty intrinsically linked to one another. KPI one is about reducing the number of killed and serious injury incidents on our network. Uh, KPI two, the lesser of the, the two KPIs that we judged on is around reducing network disruption and clearly they're linked because there are very few things that disrupt our network more than people crashing vans and trucks on them. So uh, you can see the thrust of our activity. Um, I've been here just over 12 months. It was it was actually 12 months last week. Um, we, we've shifted the focus a little bit of the team's activity in so much as there's now an increasing focus on vans. And that's, as we explain uh, in, uh, lower down in the slide, is it, a very obvious uh, correlation, very obvious uh, conclusion when you look at the fact that there are four and a half million vans on the road, those figures are increasing consistently and dramatically year on year compared to around about 400,000 trucks. The other thing that started to come out of some independent research uh, recently, uh, 
you can click the next slide for me guys is a recognition that uh, vans are actually in uh, when you look at the distance traveled and take all that into account they're actually involved in more incidents with other road users on the network than any other classification of vehicle and these are the slide you can see there was drawn from a recent PACTS uh, report that's the Parliamentary Advisory Committee on Transport Safety so a fairly high powered group which is recognising and, and drawing attention to that vans are involved in an awful lot of serious incidents on our network so it justifies the the shift in emphasis or the additional emphasis that my team are putting into the uh, into the van space you can click on the next slide for me guys thank you thanks i feel like chris witty when i'm doing this getting people to move these slides on for me excellent um some of you i'm sure have been around the, the kind of the risk side of our industry for a while will be very conscious of the swiss cheese model and it's something that we refer to quite a lot uh, at highways england and it's the concept that most major incidents are caused by not by a big mistake or a big error of judgment they're caused by the cumulative effects of a number of small decisions or lack of decisions being taken and it's wherever the, the holes in the swiss cheese line up that the bad stuff the bad stuff happens uh, the other way i had it explained to me a few weeks ago which i thought was quite interesting it's a casualty approach i don't know those of you who watch the casualty program will realize that there's a bit of a formula in so much as there'll be a character that you've never seen before appear at the start of the program and then you'll start getting little hints and um ideas of how they're going to meet their demise a little bit later on in the program where all the holes in the swiss cheese line up and something bad happens the only unfortunate difference between the casualty model and the swiss cheese model is that in casualty you get that scary bit of music just before something bad happens so at least you get five ten seconds of warning in casualty that something bad might be happened about to happen sadly uh, real life isn't quite like that but the reason that's important to us if you can click on to the next slide for us guys is it's a terrible name for a project so do forgive me i'm not taking the blame for it but we've got a had a project running at uh, highways of england for a good 12 months now we call the fatal deep dive the kind of data we get from crashes on our network is perhaps a little sketchier than people would perhaps assume that it would be and it comes in at, at, at different times as well we get early reports from the traffic officers who were attending the scene and sometimes that's a, a very good uh, very detailed report other times maybe not quite so much so dependent on the workload of the guys in dealing with the incident scene uh, we get the police reports uh, most, some of you will have heard of stats 19 and the crash reporting systems again they can sometimes leave a little to be desired and then we quite regularly get coroner reports which are massively detailed but will take a couple of years before they filter through to us so the exercise the deep dive exercise is we've gone back with uh, consultants from the traffic investigation uh, arena and looked back at uh, 67 crashes involving vans uh, which included 33 fatalities and what was absolutely clear when you looked at the the incidents is most in fact all of the incidents that we looked at were instigated by some kind of driving issue and then were often exasperated by some kind of roadworthiness issue with the vehicle so fatigue played a major part in many of the van crashes that we saw with vehicles leaving lanes and and drifting over failing to take bends driving into the back of other vehicles and various stationary objects and bit of, bits of traffic furniture around the network which were very very clearly fatigue related um we got that was coupled with a fair bit of distraction um there around usually around mobile phones and various activities along those lines uh failure to look properly judge other people's uh, speed and indeed the speed of their own vehicles are also contributory factors but the two things that stuck out like a mile like a sore thumb in these reports with the influence of fatigue and distraction um we didn't get a whole lot of impairment stuff in there we didn't seem to have as many incidents of drink or drug uh, impairment as we would see in the kind of normal car driving um uh community which was interesting but once things had started going wrong and good number of the crashes were then exasperated by roadworthiness issues and the the two which again which stuck out like a sore thumb 
were around loads, insecure loads or overloaded vehicles, which clearly would contribute fairly, uh, fairly heavily on poor, poor, um, poor um, stability and, and braking distances, et cetera, in vehicles. And tyres, it still amazes me to this day how many vans that we identify with very, very badly worn tyres, badly inflated tyres, etc. So the message of the deep dive, and it ties in nicely with the other two speakers today, is the events were, were without exception in the ones that we looked at, instigated by driving errors and then exasperated very often by roadworthiness issues. Um, could you flick the next slide for me, please, guys? Fantastic. Oh, I, I, antivirus is expired. That's wonderful. Let's get rid of that screen. Um, okay, we've been uh, looking and working with some of the police commercial vehicle units around the UK, um, carrying out some gate checks at uh, various uh, sites, some of our own contractors, some of the parcel companies, other interested bodies who've invited us onto site to check their vehicles out. Um, the slide that you're looking at now is we categorised, obviously, the faults that we were identifying um, and dropped them into the various categories. When you put them onto the chart in the order of frequency, and I think this supports some of the stuff that we've just been talking about, is the four biggest faults there, load, security, tyres, lights, obviously, and you, you could argue, would have a significant effect on vehicle safety and its risk. But the thing again, which absolutely stuck out at us, is that tells me that those vehicles weren't undergoing any form of robust pre-use defect checking process. Clearly, it's part of the operator license regime. The great majority of vehicles that we checked, probably 80% or, or so of the vehicles that we checked were vans. And I know it's not a, a, a requirement, a legal requirement in any shape or form in the van space, but good practice is absolutely that vans are uh, on the receiving end of a similar kind of pre-use defect check uh, regime as, as uh, truck uh, colleagues are. And that tells me that those vehicles weren't being looked at. Um, you know, you don't need to be a, uh, a time-served vehicle engineer to identify issues with load security, with tyres, with lights. Obviously, in you with stuff like broken mirrors, leaky fuel tanks, bits of bodywork hanging off, et cetera, et cetera. And the very simple premise that we're putting forward, if those operators were carrying out pre-use checks on the vehicles, if those drivers were engaged with carrying out pre-use checks, a good 80% of the issues that we identified across the uh, uh, gate checks that we've been carrying out for the last six months or so, they simply wouldn't have been there when we got there, which has got to be good from a, from a safety point of view. Can you click, click the next slide for me, chaps? Thank you very much. So what can we look at doing? Something that Highways England works a lot on, and you'll, you'll see the a reference to a scratched record there, because I know I sound like a scratch record on this, because anybody that's heard me present previously will know that I do go on about this a little bit. But we're looking at lead indicators. Um, we're trying to understand the kind of things which would indicate to us as a, as a highways body that there are likely to be incidents, where those incidents are likely to be and what the severity of them are. Are likely is likely to be and the flip side of it of course if we can identify and improve the lead indicators then the crashes shouldn't happen in the first place so two main areas and two priority topics for us which we uh, are working on very hard at the moment is from a driving style point of view speed um let me be clear about this it's not necessarily just high speed it's inappropriate speed which is a big issue for us um as an aside, with the dropping traffic on the network that we saw, particularly during the first couple of lockdowns, um, speeds went up, average speeds. The, uh, those of you <laughs> who see the Daily Mail from time to time, they'll know that there were some extraordinary speeds being recorded on our network. Uh, those idiots aside, average speeds came up. But whilst the average speed was going up on our network, the number of crashes was actually going down because the speeds, although higher, clearly weren't massively inappropriate. Um, harsh map braking manoeuvres are also a big indicator for us and we're working with a, a number of the telematics providers, Webfleet included, to try and identify heat maps of where harsh braking manoeuvres are, 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 are being performed with a view to seeing if there is something that we can do to, to mitigate and to reduce those. 
the vehicle one is a really interesting one for us um, because vehicle conditions, we, we did some work, as I mentioned, with the police. And one of the things I asked us before they went in is what kind of things should they be looking for on vans as an indicator that it would be worth having a bit more of a look at it. And one of the things that we suggested almost flippantly, but it turned out to be a really good indicator, was just the state of the van. Was the rubbish all over the all over the dashboard, for example? And you know, I'll, I'll take the view if a if a driver can't be bothered getting rid of a three week old, you know, McDonald's wrapper or a coffee cup or a copy of a newspaper, then they're pretty damn unlikely to have spent any time checking their vehicle's condition that day. Which brings me back to pre-use checks, and you know, those of you have uh, I've been around for a while. I was with FTA for a, for a long time, running the Van Excellence Program, and one of the things that we saw time and time again was that when businesses implemented robust pre-use check processes on their vehicles, all sorts of good stuff happened. Their VOR times were reduced, their number of prosecutions were produced. But interestingly, other measures of that driver behaviour, which you'd think would probably be unrelated to the fact that the checks were being carried out, happened as well. We were picking up better, fewer speeding offences, uh, even better driver retention at a couple of businesses. And I think that's around professionalisation. It's about that van driver being taken seriously within his organisation, their organisation, as a professional, professional commercial vehicle driver. Might not be all that they do during that day. They could be a civil engineer, a plumber, a butcher baker, a candlestick maker. But let's behave in a professional manner as far as the commercial vehicle side of things is concerned, which, as we all know, is probably, without doubt, the most dangerous thing that that uh, individual does all day. And the scratch record bit from me is it's ever so easy, guys. We just learn from truck operators. They've been doing it for donkey's years in the way that they expect their drivers be to behave, the, uh, the support they give them in terms of their professionalisation and their, their knowledge. You can hit the next slide for me, guys. That's great. Um, I don't know if any of you guys recognise this fella. He's, he's a very senior police officer we've worked with for, for, for a number of years in different guises. It's a chap called Chief Superintendent Paul Kesey. He's uh, probably one of the most senior and influential traffic cops in the UK. He writes all the, uh, the strategies for, for policing in the, in the UK, uh, in England, rather, to be more correct about it. Uh, Gloucestershire Constabulary is a smashing fella. Sadly, he's a West Bromwich Albion fan, but we won't hold that against him. Um, but one of the things I've heard Paul do on a number of occasions, which just sums this concept up absolutely perfectly for me, is he'll get a bunch of van and truck operators in a room and he'll ask them a very straightforward question is how many of you run your vans and your trucks to different operational standards? And every time I've seen him do it, the room splits into three. And he'll, ask, he'll ask the guys, first of all, put their hand up if they run vans. They say, OK, terrific. Put your hand up if you run trucks and people automatically take the hand out and say, no, no, leave your hand up, put your other hand up if you run trucks as well. So you always end up with a, a room full of people doing this. He'll then ask that question, do you run your vans and trucks to different standards? Every time I've seen him do it, the room splits into three groups. There are those who do run their vans and trucks to the same standard. There are those who don't run their vans and the trucks to the same standard, but they're avoiding eye, eye contact and not going to admit it to anybody. And there are those braver souls in there who do run their vans and trucks to different standards and will admit so. He'll then ask the killer question, which is why? And sooner or later, somebody in that room will offer the same response. Every single time, it's been exactly the same response. And the response is, Paul, it's because the law's different, which is exactly the answer that he's looking for, because the law isn't different. The law is exactly the same for trucks as it is for vans. There are laws about loading in both camps at hours, about vehicle roadworthiness. There's a parallel piece of legislation maybe the same piece of legislation on every single one of those topics, which is great because it gets Paul to his punchline now, which is please don't have a crash on my watch in one of your vans where we can identify that the causation was around the fact that you, although you do know how to run some of your fleet properly, you have chosen not to do so with some of your other fleet. I, you know how to run your trucks properly, but you've decided not to do it on your vans. And the punchline with all of this is please don't have that crash because if that is the case, we're coming after you because you do know how to do it.
So that's kind of my, where I finished for today before handing over to, to Peter from Fleet Check to pick up on this topic. But guys, learn from the truck operators. There's an awful lot that they do properly and very, very well, which translates really well into the van space. My experience is those who run their vans properly think they're little trucks. The ones who get it wrapped around their neck think they're funny shaped cars and it is almost as straightforward as that. So thanks for your time, guys. Happy to pick up any questions uh, either now or later in the session. Thanks, Andy. That was um, really unbelievably insightful, um, especially for a lot of our audience members. We've had some great questions coming in already. Um, please keep submitting the questions into the question box as we go. Um, one that has come in so far um, already, Mark, um, is how what's the average cost of having to close a lane on a motorway not only to a business for their own business having that vehicle off the road but also the impact to other businesses has any research been done on that <laughs> i'm sure there has been and i'm sure it will vary from road to road and time to time um we used to have a wonderful thing with my time at fta something we called a dossiterism uh, we had a, a press officer called jeff dossiter bless him who, who had the an airing ability to make numbers up on the spot and then when you check them out you find out you're right which is really annoying um but i remember jeff putting out something a, a while ago but it was kind of almost something like a you know hundred thousand pound a minute or something or other I, I, I obviously don't know it's clearly an awful lot of money yeah, well absolutely i know that i remember reading a report, a report a while back from from the rac that said the average cost of one lcv to that individual business being off the road is about 730 pounds per day um so to think that that cost for for one day could be absolutely yeah. avoided just by treating your vans with the same uh, precision and care that perhaps you would treat your lcvs um uh, your hgv sorry uh, makes total sense um so right, i'm now going to Sorry, is, is we did do some work uh, just sorry, just to quickly interject back in the previous life uh, looking at the impact of vehicle off road time regardless of why that vehicle was off the road and certainly in a number of industries civil engineers i remember in particular it was a massively high cost because if that van which was supporting the activity of let's say a couple of free operatives out of it got all their tools all the specialist equipment in the back if that's off the road that is easily a couple of three thousand pounds a day in terms of on costs which is it can potentially be seriously impactful for a business especially if they've already got two days off the road already for a service and an mot um so thanks for thanks for that mark we'll come back and you'll be able to ask some more questions of mark later on um, i'm now going to pass over to peter golding of uh, fleet check who's going to take us through how we can minimize those risks and make sure that our vans are up to speed and up to scratch when they're out on the road to, to minimize that downtime peter good morning Good morning, uh, Matt, thank you very much and uh, appreciate the time this morning to go through. Uh, Mark, thank you for your presentation. Yes, I will dovetail into some of the points that you've raised. Um, so I'm the founder and MD of Fleet Check, um, sort of giving you just a very quick overview of who we are and what we do. Uh, I started the company over 15 years ago. Prior to that, I had 25 years in the industry as an authorised examiner and a garage owner. So I've had a lot of experience on the uh, the mechanical side of the industry. Uh, we do specialise in supporting SMEs and uh, we do a lot mainly with the commercial vehicles, whether that be um, uh, HGVs, uh, but we do a substantial, literally tens of thousands of vans that we help and support the management of those with over 50,000 or so users. And we've been recognised for it, which is gratifying. I'm very proud of the relationship we forged with Webfleet now. I think it's over 12 years as an integration partner. And really at the heart of what I want to cover today is how you can use data and support uh, the information that's available and how that data can really um, give you an insight into far more of the activities uh, within the, the, the running of your fleet. Um, the slide here, and again, we're very limited on time today, so I shall just cover some of the high level points, but I'm gonna focus predominantly on the HGV comparisons that Mark's mentioned, but bringing data in this holistic view, I mean, you've got fantastic data that can comes, comes through from Webfleet. The telematic data now, as Mark's intimated, you know, when you're looking at speed in, you're looking at um, uh, excessive break-in, uh, and I'll touch on fatigue in a moment. These areas are really important, but when you combine those with data from license check-in or maintenance safety inspections, as we've been talking about, um, you get a far greater 
point of view and you can start to build a profile of those drivers that potentially are a high risk to you and your organization and then your time can be spent really focusing in on what you can do with those. I thought it would be appropriate to just at least mention what's happened clearly in the last 12 months and none of us actually expected to be uh, working from home, especially still now, as I think majority of us are. Um, but what has that meant? Um, well, actually, for companies, when they're accessing data um, and they're looking at trying to be able to provide and share that data with colleagues, technology really has come into its fore. We're seeing now literally a uh, substantial increase in companies uh, requesting uh, to, to view our software, but predominantly because of this isolation and the fact that we're dealing with it. And if you compound that with what we're looking at, which paper has been, although we've all aspired to have paperless offices for many years, I know it's been talked about, they never really come to anywhere. Um, what we're dealing with now is the reality, because if you've got drivers scattered across the country, hopefully doing inspections, or you've got pieces of paper being circulated, now is the time really to look at that. So, so for my side, really, it's a matter of that data. But what do you do with the data? And I think picking up on the point that Mark has raised is who we can learn from. And in, there's no question uh, we, we have uh, thousands of operators, both with HGVs and LTVs, and we can see the differential between the two uh, organizations. Those, as Mark mentioned, that run both. Um, should know better. I mean, and actually DVSA look very unfavorably at any organizations who are not operating their vans to the same standard as that uh, would have expected to operate their trucks, as in with known defects on them. But what I want to try and do in the limited amount of time we've got is really just sort of look at three key areas, legal compliance, uh, driver engagement, which I know across the board, everyone we talk to, this is a problem, especially within the van sector, um, and clearly how you tie it together. Um, so looking at the legal issues, I mean, this is uh, the end of the day, Mark cited some pretty tragic statistics there and what's happening on the highways. But I really do feel, especially as an engineer, that the sort of looking at the defects to start off with uh, is an area that is close to my heart. I mean, if you look at the failure rates here, 42% for class sevens, I mean, that means basically 42% of vans between three and three and a half tons potentially are illegal on the road. Um, so as an MOT tester and past, you know, we would be frequently looking at things, as has been mentioned, on tyres. This does not happen and should not happen within the HGV world. Why? Well, as we'll touch on in a minute, they are required to do daily inspections. But the primary thing that DVSA are expecting them to do is have a management of login defects. If there is a defect identified by a driver, or uh, by uh, PMI inspection, a safety inspection carried out by a competent garage, that defect, if it hasn't been remedied, needs to be logged and recorded. And only once that open defect is then closed, will DVSA be happy? Obviously, there's a lot we can learn from that. And my recommendation is any of you on the call today who are running vans, look at your defect side. It's an area of major concern. You may well have recommendations sitting in your filing cabinets um, from a garage who's done a service on your vehicle that said the front tires or front brakes um, required changing in six or 10,000 miles. Or they could be, as a lot of you may not realize, advisory notifications on your MOTs, which um, <clears throat> again, you know, they're telling you this because you need to action it. Just filing that away is not good enough. You need to look at those defects because rest assured, the police can access those records just as easily. And you can go in now and look at your own records yourselves. Um, on DVLA. This is something which um, has really borne out, I think, with those stats that Mark showed there, as far as the serious incidences and accidents that happen um, from uh, fatigue. Um, it's, it's again, we're, we're looking at the HGV operations. Um, they are governed at, um, at the moment by EU rules and to have tachographs fitted. So anything over three and a half tons has a tachograph fitted. What does that mean? There's no rules apply to the vans. Absolutely not the case. There is massive ignorance here. GB domestic rules stipulate what hours van drivers can drive. We've all seen deliveries of parcels come into our doors at nine o'clock in the morning and they were on the road since six. 
if you're looking at the rules and if you are unfamiliar with it, please do look at it on the government site. So I haven't put a link on there, but obviously we'll be happy to ask questions afterwards, time permitting. But GD domestic rules apply to every single company in the country. So if you're unfamiliar with it, I would strongly recommend uh, you look at it and go through that site. Licence check-in and the medical side sort of go together as far as we're concerned. Again, the lessons to be learned. If you want to apply for a class one driving licence, you have to have a medical before you can even apply. And that was introduced after that tragic case in Glasgow. But in addition to that, the frequency of inspections of licences once you are driving uh, is a minimum normally of six months for HGV operators. A lot of them do it every three months, and this is an area we support companies with. And if the drivers, HGV drivers, once they hit 45, they've got to go back into medical. Now, when I'm talking to companies and my team are talking to companies, we're asking about the frequency of license check-in or the accuracy of the license check-in. Just checking the photo card clearly is not checking the license. And you cannot use your driver's uh, national insurance number and driving license number to go onto the DBLA site yourself. Even if they signed a declaration to say you can do that, they either have to sign um, a mandate to say you can look at their information or they need to give you the code. It's really important on that side. So it's an area we're looking at. But you can see here, 33% of drivers have had their uh, have license revoked. So we're looking at a huge statistic on that side. Okay, engaging drivers. Um, so again, we'll, we'll cover off the sort of three areas on this to sort of give a, an insight. Mark's again touched on this and laboured this point because it's really, really important. Um, if we're looking at it, whether it be FOURS, uh, which we uh, work on and work closely with, um, or the Van Excellence Programme for the van operators, um, you are as a prerequisite, you have to do a daily, daily walk around inspection. We're seeing a massive adoption now in this. Um, for example, our app, which has been in circulation for over three years now, we've just gone over 10 million checks that have been done on it. And it is a really easy way to get your drivers uh, to be able to carry out the inspection. You know what they've been done, you know, it's been done, you've got a time date stamp on it as well. And those more important defects will wean their way back through to you. If you're looking at the comparison against with HGVs, they have to do it. Not only do they have to get, they have to be trained on how to do it and the whole process needs to work. So for us, twofold really one you need to make sure your drivers are doing it and the second thing you need to make sure your drivers are competent and can do that so have you put the appropriate checks in place and that's something recently we've added into the app not only have the drivers got to confirm they're fit to drive they're not under the influence of alcohol or drugs but they actually are competent to be able to do those checks so it's again there is technology there so really saying it's a real problem trying to get drivers to do it it really isn't and it's something that can easily be done an area that I constantly worry about is the, uh, um, is, excuse my, sorry, my second second. Um, my, um, I'm, my, um, sorry, just distracted there for a second. Um, the, um, the, the drivers, um, HGV operators have to have 35 hours of training um, uh, every five years. Well, as far as, H, so basically a prerequisite of being an HGV driver, as far as the, um, as you've seen this all the time, that people come into rooms. So one of the downsides of working from home. So apologies for that. Um, but as far as the HGV drivers are doing 35 hours of training every every five years, there isn't any specific requirements for LCB operators to carry out any training. Um, but we would really recommend that your drivers uh, are, look, you know, whether we're talking about the competency of doing safety checks, um, or just in fairness, the maneuvering of some of these vans. One minute they could be driving a Fiesta, and the next thing you put them into a long wheelbase sprinter with no rear view mirror. Um, I mean, we all too frequently see damage to rear bumpers, but you know, which can be annoying. But if you think about hitting to a post, which is the final financial implications, imagine if it wasn't a post and it was a cyclist. So these are areas, again, which we can learn from. Um, speed limits. It's mentioned, Mark said, there was a lot of issues to do with speeding here. Um, you know, we're 85% recorded motor offences for speeding, um, but there is ignorance here. HGVs are regulated 56 miles an hour and they have set limits that they can do on uh, single carriageways. A lot of van operators don't seem to appreciate that if you are running anything but a car derived van, and in fairness, there are very few of those now, um, you are limited, your, your speed is 10 miles an hour on, on dual carriageways and single carriageways less. 
Now, your drivers may not be aware of this, but the ANPR cameras are. So be aware, education, 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 um, scenario to look at on that side. Okay, finally, just to wrap it up on the administration side, we're looking at uh, sort of, again, three key areas here. Again, aligned into the comparisons between uh, the HTV operators and the LCVs. And this is an area of constant uh, annoyance to me that the manufacturers uh, are now extending the intervals of inspections on uh, light commercial vehicles up to 30,000 miles. We've seen even more than that with some of the, uh, the calculations on the, uh, but 24 months. I mean, your gas central heating boiler would be serviced every year, but it's deemed that a vehicle doesn't need to be safety inspected in for every two years. And the only reason this has happened is that they've improved the quality of the oil. So what they've managed to do, the manufacturers, much as they care about the vehicles, they don't really care if your brakes and tyres are warm because that's not their responsibility, that's your responsibility. For HGV operators operating a similar size vehicle, say a jumbo that's got the, the, a weight increase of maybe four and a half tonnes, that vehicle will go from three and a half to four and a half, which means that would need to be inspected, depend upon the, the agreed arrangements with the uh, DVSA, six, eight, ten weeks. Um, and that vehicle would have to be inspected daily by a driver. Whereas an LCV, we're looking at two years and 30,000 miles. Um, and so really for me, the big issue here is there used to be a time where garages would take responsibility for the safety and durability of your vehicle. The responsibility now is with yourselves. You are the operator of the vehicles and please don't think because you're having it serviced every two years that you're covered. It absolutely isn't a garage inspection every two years. My recommendation would be to look at the use of the vehicle and have a minimum of a 12 month safety inspection. Relatively modest cost but gives you the assurance that your vehicles are safe. I touched on fours um, and the same with Van Excellence. I mean fours has been well adopted by so many companies, some of them because they're looking at contractual work they want to do in London, but more and more businesses now want to be able to prove that they are operating to a recognised standard. If you run in an HGV truck, you know, fleet, you will be audited um, either by um, you, Logistics UK, as they're called now, um, used to be formerly FTA, uh, or um, uh, or the other bodies that are out there that do this, but or DVSA can just turn up on site and say, show me your records. Um, so what a lot of business is now, and it may be something that you need to look at, because having to prove that you've been independently audited and you can guarantee that you're operating to a recognised standard, industry standard, then I would say it's worthy of looking at. And that is a way to differentiate yourself in the market and looks good when you're tendering for work and things like that. Sort of concluding really where we are on this side, um, record keeping is at the heart of what we do. Um, uh, so many times we talk to companies who lease vehicles and they say it's not our responsibility, it's the leasing company. Rest assured, if you're in court, it will be you in court, not the leasing company. You absolutely should be able to have access to all of your fleet maintenance records and details and have that information. Um, so if anyone, good God forbid, walks through the door and says, please show me your records, um, um, Mark's earlier show, Paul, this is where you should have access to everything that you need to demonstrate you're doing it properly. Many, many companies we talk to, in fact, the vast majority heavily rely on spreadsheets to try and do this. And being fair, spreadsheets are not a robust audit trail. And it's an area more so now than ever you need to look at to see how you keep the, the records on that side. So just to wrap, um, how can we help? Well, we obviously would be delighted to. Um, Obviously, as far as we're concerned, the three key issues that we address with companies is this legal concern. It tends not to be the first driver, although peace of mind is something everyone aspires to have. Uh, mainly the sort of key issues we see coming through is sinking under admin. So looking at this fragmented data and trying to centralize it. But I would still say engaging your drivers um, and getting those to be taking that responsibility. I think Mark talked about professionalism. Oh, the best way to do that is to demonstrate to your drivers that they are professional drivers, although they're driving vans, um, you know, they should feel, take pride in their, in their cabs, clearly keep it clean, otherwise they might get pulled over. Um, so anyway, that concludes where we are. I'm sorry if we've gone over on time a little bit. And uh, so back to you, Matt. No, thanks for that, Peter. That was um, excellent. Again, we've had loads of questions coming in, guys, so thank you very much for the questions. Keep them coming. Um, one of the questions, just very quickly for you, Peter, was um, 
how do you when you're pitching this to drivers how do you overcome driver resistance with regards to having to do a daily walk around check uh, and how do you make sure it actually gets done okay that's a, a good question and actually one that's asked a lot i mean often it can be combined with the fact that they don't have a company phone they have their own phone um what we find uh, in most cases um it should be in their uh, come drop contract employment um, you you do need to stipulate this and one can't really argue about the legality everybody knows if you uh, were going to Scotland today uh, um, I don't know for whatever reason almost everyone would check their oil check the tires but most people van drivers are going to Scotland every week with the combined journeys that they're doing so I think it you have to be firm with the drivers um, you have to say it is a legal requirement and ultimately, if the drivers then start to realise if something does go wrong, they will be in court alongside the fleet manager, alongside the directors of the businesses. And once that's reinforced with the drivers and that this is a legal requirement and this is an obligation that you have to have as an employee, then being blunt, they should have no choice. Excellent. So it's just like, say, a large education piece to really try and hammer it home to them and, and, and actually having, I suppose, the, the culture within the business to then follow up and make sure it happens, because ultimately it is something that all businesses have to do. That, that, that's actually a really valid point, because condoning somebody not doing it is you could be held culpable. Um, and there are real serious fines now for companies if they can be held culpable uh, for issues with the courts, because if you know they should. Oh, it's, it looks as though we may have just lost Peter. That's fine. So thank you very much for that. Hopefully we'll get checks, Peter back. And you're not um, adhering to it or you've instigated it, but you don't chase it up. Um, sorry, Peter, we lost you for a minute there. It's OK. We'll catch back up afterwards. <laughs> OK, hopefully I'm, I'm um, So now all I'm right, going to. Let, OK, no problem at all. All right, I'll switch my camera. Up. Thanks. Uh, so now I'm going to move on and just have a look at the power of integrations, uh, how integrations work and what they can do for your business and actually uh, why we should even be looking at them um, when we're talking about it. So to start off with, uh, I just want to take a quick look at, I mean, what even are integrations? Um, very simply, um, it's one thing or device or system talking to another device or system and sharing data. So this could be something which is very 21st century, like having a smart fridge where it knows when your um, fridge is out of milk and automatically orders some more from Amazon or something like that. Um, or it could be the, the example of a software engineer that I heard where, for example, he outsourced all of his day job um, to some workers in China and built himself an integration on his computer so that he all he had to do was hit a button on his PC and by the time he'd walked on over to the coffee machine there was a hot piping coffee ready and waiting for him so just FYI ultimately I wouldn't condone that at all uh, he was caught that he was outsourcing all of his day job and ultimately sacked so integrations are excellent but um, don't um, abuse them I suppose is what I'm going to say so okay so things can talk to each other great so what why should we be looking at integrations within our businesses uh, as a way of making things easier uh, and looking at them as an ace up our sleeve so to speak so the first advantage is that businesses stay in their lane or in other words they stick to what they're good at so you wouldn't want your bank manager telling you how to fix your boiler um, similarly you wouldn't want your telematics firm in charge of your payroll department by using integrations it allows companies to specialize and really stick to what they're good at and focus on their customers and solving one specific problem and then bringing in other specialists so you get the best of every area that you could look at rather than being a, a jack of all trades and ultimately a master of none so to bring back our uh gym analogy from last series telematics specifically works best as a data aggregator it works best in providing you with that data so in using the gym analogy where telematics is a gym full of equipment using an integration partner is like having a personal trainer that takes that data and really shows you how to get the most from that equipment from that data so in terms of uh, Webfleet Solutions on that matter. Webfleet Solutions has over 200 integration partners to ensure that you can get the most out of your data in any capacity, whether that be a compliance management platform like FleetCheck, for example, or whether that be a camera integration 
or whether that be a, a payload weighing system to check that your vehicles are not overladen and illegal. Um, ultimately, one of the key advantages of integrations is the ability to eliminate unnecessary administration. Um, Peter's already mentioned that quite often within businesses, they will share a spreadsheet in terms of managing their vehicles, which opens a business up to a litany of er errors, A, because anybody can edit it at any time uh, and nobody might pick up on or notice that error. Um, and the other thing that businesses do is they will utilize carbon copies for doing their vehicle workaround checks or for uh, their warehouse management and order forms. Uh, and ultimately, it, it just results in way more pieces of paper that, that are absolutely necessary because either you've got to have as a business, someone consistently typing in copies to a computer of all the pieces of paper that come in or they just get filed away in a drawer somewhere and forgotten about and actually if anything was to happen and you were audited to say look what checks and balances and process do you have in place it may be the case that you go to find a particular record and it's either been not handed in it's been damaged or it's simply not there so by using integrations between two partners so that actually you can digitize something like your daily vehicle war crown checks, where they were carried out, what time they were carried out, and by what vehicle, which is then stored digitally. So it's really easy to find and access when you find it. You can absolutely eliminate unnecessary administration. So one of the other benefits is not only with reduced administration time, so you feel like, I mean, a lot of fleet managers and transport managers that I've spoken to have felt like they're constantly chasing their tail with regards to administration. Not only will you have more time on your hands and time is money, um, it allows you to manage your fleet from a maintenance perspective much more effectively. So I spent a lot of years working in contract hire, dealing with LCV fleets and, com and uh, company cars. Um, and one of the really key aspects was people used to try and manage large fleets, kind of 80, 100, 150 vehicle fleets, or even actually 10 or 15 vehicle fleets, just using a spreadsheet um, and thinking that was sufficient. But ultimately, when it came around to service time or MOT, there would always be a vehicle inevitably that got missed. Um, and there was one instance where one of my customers, um, one driver did get missed and it was one of their really top salespeople who was always really busy out on the road. Um, kind of visiting prospects and his dashboard looked a lot like the one in that picture. It, it looked pretty much like a Christmas tree. And despite getting multiple service reminders, it just got forgotten about. Ultimately, there was an engine failure. The vehicle broke down on the side of the road and had to be recovered. And then when it was taken away to the local garage, they took one look at the vehicle and said, this is 4,000 miles past its last service required, uh, its last service we can't uphold the warranty in this vehicle so just purely through poor management of their fleet it cost them seven and a half thousand pounds for a new engine which just through better management and using systems talking to each other could have been completely avoided there's also the element that by using integrations you can actually minimize your risk exposure peter already said that um, 33 percent of all drivers when inspected had some sort of issue with regards to the driving license. And again, I can attest to this firsthand, having had experience of customers previously when actually they used a, uh, an integration and a partner like Fleet Check went on to look at their driver's licenses, found drivers that were actually disqualified, not only with a lot of points, but actually physically disqualified and they'd failed to inform the business. But also, I think the worst one I ever heard of was um, there was a driver with 42 points on his license, which is just absolutely astounding. I mean, ultimately, it came down to he was still legal and he'd been acquitted by a judge. But it's court time. You've, you've got to make sure you are doing everything reasonably practicable within your fleet to make sure that if you are ever audited for whatever reason, if, if an incident does occur, unfortunately, and unfortunately they do, that you have covered your back because ultimately not only the driver but the fleet manager and the directors could go to prison if they're found to be negligent so why not make your life easier by using and harnessing the power of integrations and systems talking to each other like telematics like fleet check to make sure that if anything does go wrong you know you're absolutely covered 
So that was kind of a brief whistle stop overview and tour of integrations and potentially how they can benefit your business. Um, I'd now like to open up the floor to questions. So if you'd like to rejoin us, Peter and Mark, um, thank you very much for the questions that have come in so far. Please do keep them coming. Um, I will just wait for them both back. Excellent. Cheers, gents. Um, so one of the ones that has come back already, Mark, was um, they found your present. Well, one of the people in the audience, thank you very much for sending this in, thought that your presentation was really hard hitting and powerful. And actually, they'd quite like to give that presentation and show their company van drivers just so that they can be aware of the potential impacts. Um, uh, is there the possibility that they could share this with their drivers or um, I suppose obviously of course this webinar will ab be available on a recorded basis afterwards but is there a way that people could find the slides? Yeah absolutely I hate it when my mum listens to these presentations but thanks for the feedback. Um, <laughs> Yes, more than happy to. Uh, if you, I don't know if you want to, what the best route is, guys. But if you drop me an email address over or or, or something, yeah, absolutely no problem with with sharing the slide deck. And you know, if there's anything else that we need, something that might be worth just throwing into that as well. If you if you want to drop us your details over, we are just in the process of producing us a whole set of van driver tool uh, kit resource, which is very much aimed at trying to support operators in in bringing. Their, their van operations to the standards that we've, we've been talking about today. So yeah, short answer is yes, absolutely. Excellent, people would be glad to hear that. So um, there's one here for you, Peter, which is at the moment, my maintenance department uses a manual that includes cost of parts. Um, does the Fleet Check platform allow me to log costs automatically as part of this digital process? Yes, yes. I mean, basically any data that you, you currently hold that comes in from providers, um, yeah, that can go through. We can look at your whole of life costs um, and the same with the fuel data and any other data set you've got. If it comes in an electronic format, we can just automatically import that straight in. So, yeah, prerequisite, we would bring that in. Excellent. Um, and similarly, uh, following on from that, um, they also wanted to know by using a solution like Fleet Check, is it only for larger fleets that are harder to manage or um, is this solution available for smaller fleets as well? Well, no, actually, it's a very good question. I launched Fleet Check for small fleets. Um, when I looked at the market 15 years ago, everyone was trying to support 1,000, 2,000 vehicle fleets. and Nobody was looking after the 10, 20, 30 van fleets. So I launched it to help van operators. We also made it cost effective. Uh, so it starts at £4 per vehicle per month. So you're looking at a very small investment uh, to, to get it up and running. There is a, a premium product, you know, professional level at £6, but £4 are entry level product. And that includes the app. Uh, as well. So it's very cost effective. Um, but yeah, I designed it specifically to help. And also the companies who tend to use it, fleet management is not their core job. It's a byproduct of what they do on the daily basis. So we've made it as intuitive as we possibly can. And we pull all the data across from DDLA and things like that. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Um, there's a question that's come in for Mark just with regards to obviously on the motorways now, we've been seeing a lot more speed control devices, if you like, in terms of the overhead gantries that are going across all of the motorways. Um, most of our drivers are constantly complaining to them, saying that actually they're always uh, at lower speeds when there's no traffic there. Um, I mean, how does how are these systems helping to improve safety at the minute? I think one of the things that's interesting is they're not, it's not just about safety, they're also tied into the uh, carbon dioxide and the environmental stuff. So sometimes when you see the figures come down for reasons, it's actually to try and control some of the environmental uh, conditions around the network as well. Um, speed is an issue, as we've, we've discussed earlier, it's a contributory factor in not just causations of crashes, but also the severity of crash as well. Um, they're there for a reason, is the honest answer. And it's also, apart from the obvious safety stuff, it helps us control network flows as well to try and keep the, the journey times consistent across the network. Um, yeah, they're there for a reason, guys. So, I mean, there's also been quite a lot of talk around kind of the dangers of, of smart motorways and some horror stories in, in the press. Um, are highways, highways England reviewing the strategy of how they use to make sure that, that they are acting as intended? Yeah, they're all, they're, they're, they've been constantly under review, to be honest, guys, regardless of the you know the recent press coverage and that. I mean, conclusively, overall, they're safer. Um, the, the reason for that is when motorways start getting congested, drivers start diverting off motorways onto less safe roads. So the crashes increase off 
the network when the network's congested so the more uh, less congestion, the more traffic flow on the network. Overall, the uh, the the, the um, statistics are better. But having said that, clearly we've had some terrible incidents on on the smart motorways, which you know, and genuinely that that affects us badly. You know, we take it very very seriously. One of the big areas that you'll see uh, activity going on in the next few months is a whole uh, campaign just trying to really demonstrate to all drivers the safe ways of handling breakdowns and incidents on all of our networks not just the smart motorways um and it's it's about an understanding of what's required and you know that that is an area we're doing a lot of work on at the moment is trying to get the message across one of the projects my team's involved with and again you'll see more of this going forwards is recognizing that commercial vehicle drivers are actually some of the best drivers out on our network but they're only a commercial vehicle driver during their working hours the rest of the time they're a dad a brother a mom uncle rubber etc so what we are working on is giving the kind of information to the commercial vehicle drivers not just to support them in the day job but also to empower them as mentors and all the rest of it to those people that they've got an influence on you know do you know what to do and i can share this from a kind of a personal point of view is conversation with my family about what would they do in the case of a uh, a breakdown or a, a, a similar incident on, on any of our fast roads is, to be honest, I didn't actually have that much of an understanding of what to do. And, you know, I won't spoil the surprise when the advert comes up, but go left is the is the theme of it. You get as far over to the left on the road as you possibly can, get out of your vehicle. And the other biggie is, you know, whoever you might think of ringing to help you out, the AA, the RAC, your mom, your dad, your uncle, all the rest of it, ring the police. Let somebody know that you are there and we'll get the gantry lights turned on within a matter of seconds to at least start giving some protection. Our traffic officers will be on the way, emergency services are needed. Don't call your mom, call the police. That's a terrible strap line for something, isn't it? I should not deny having said that. <laughs> No, but it makes perfect sense. It's, it's you can't, as Highways England, do anything at all uh, unless you know that it's happening. So unless you... Uh, uh, notify the appropriate agencies uh, it, there's nothing that they can do and um, there's one come through for you Peter which is um, we run a fairly small fleet and using integrations like the ones mentioned and going digital sounds quite expensive and um, what are the key areas that companies see a, a return on this investment in when you go in and speak to them that's a good point and actually it does come up a lot because this isn't necessarily budgeted for as i mentioned uh, it's a very cost effective platform but roi is really what the bean counters like the finance directors are always looking for um, and in most cases we would be looking between the three and four times return on investment on the what you're looking at on very simple things reducing the maintenance spend as mark mentioned well maintained vehicles uh, downtime you know unexpected downtime anything from 700 to 2000 pounds a day um these you know these are areas that we um, can very uh, easily um, keep things going and if we're looking at the defect management side you know making sure defects are identified quickly and easily this again can reduce downtime and potentially reduce the cost a part warm tire um replaced or brake pads are replaced on time and not wait until the brake the discs go through but our general rule fuel is an easy one for us because we'll bring in fuel data we'll compare that with the data from telematics so anyone basically with a web fleet system if they're on the call today we can integrate with it's a really relatively simple transition we just bring the data straight across but we can take the fuel data for example and give you meaningful mpg analysis which can actually really help with profiling because there's only two reasons that you've got poor MPG, it's going to be there's um, a, a driver behavior issue, or well, three actually. There's driver behavior issue, there's a mechanical defect on the vehicle, which doesn't happen very often, or potentially fuel theft, which unfortunately is quite prevalent with van drivers. Um, so it's an area which we can help on. So these are all quick, but being honest, yeah, we can easily uh, demonstrate a return on investment. Yeah, absolutely. And just to um, speak with regards to fuel theft, um, I, again, it's something that we experience quite widely within Webfleet Solutions, especially with LCV drivers. Is it is so easy to when you go fill up at a petrol station to slide open the side door and fill up a tank inside, um, and so the facility to check uh, against your fuel card reports um, the actual fuel usage using um, the data that you can get from Webfleet because we're dialed into the vehicle's canvas um, can be really really powerful. 
Um, so, gents, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. We've been running for just about an hour. Um, we will be running episode three of the Prove, Protect, Prevent, Protect webinar series in a month's time, where we will be looking at how LCV fleets can look at improving their workflow. Thank you. For, thank you very much for your time, everybody, and uh, see you next time. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.